visitors to London could be forgiven for thinking that they're seeing a quintessentially British town. The imperial architecture, the iconic black taxis and red phone boxes. But behind these picture postcard images, London is one of the most multicultural capitals in the world. More than a third of Londoners belong to a minority ethnic group and speak one of the 200 different languages in this city of 8 million. Nowhere is this more apparent than in London's East End, an area that has seen centuries of migration. Food has played a unique role in the integration of these new arrivals. Migrants may lose their language, their customs, even their religion, but seldom their food. Food is more often than not the gift they bring to their new home. In East London, one road in particular tells this familiar story. This is street food, and this is Brick Lane. Brick Lane, or Bangla Town, is at the heart of Britain's Bangladeshi community. They're the latest in a long line of migrants who have made Brick Lane their home. Unlike the peoples before them, they brought their own distinct mark, dare I say flavour, to this part of London. I think the popularity is because uh, the spices. I think spicy is like, um, I'm not going to say drug. Once you taste curry, you can't get away from it. It becomes a normal thing. In the weekend, Friday, Saturday, you go out, you have a curry and a beer. Curry has become Britain's national dish and Brick Lane its unofficial capital. But the Bangladeshis are new arrivals to an area that has seen many communities come and go. The East End has long been the first port of call for new arrivals. Cheap accommodation downwind and downriver from what Londoners call simply the city, the financial heart of London, is still the most expensive real estate in Europe. In the 18th century, Protestant Huguenots fled religious persecution in France, arriving in London's East End to build new homes and an imposing church on what was then Marchland. But today, only an inscription on the facade remains to record their presence. Umbra Sumos. We are shadows. In the 19th century, migration made London the biggest city in the world, as the docks, warehouses and factories of the East End expanded to process the wealth flowing in from the British Empire. The docks have long since been converted into office space, and the last remaining cranes are now museum pieces. The warehouses have become expensive flats, and the factories, fashionable bars and clubs. Only the street food remains as it was in the past. Paul Simpson's family have been selling the same food for 90 years to the working men and women of the East End. Cheap food from the muddy waters of the nearby Thames. It's just an old traditional East End food. People have been eating them for so long that they just keep coming back. They're whelks, like a sea snail. You can make curries with them or stir fries or things or just eat them like that. The original Tubby Isaacs was Jewish. A strange choice of career since eels, cockles and whelks are not acceptable or kosher according to Jewish dietary law. And my family were Jewish, well, my ancestors were Jewish, so I mean, we're not now actually, but sort of fell out of it. But, um, so yeah, it, it, well, it's not kosher food, so Orthodox Jews couldn't eat it, but there was a lot of Jews that weren't Orthodox who loved it, so around this area that's what we have. And then now it's like Bengalis, and they, they don't really eat this food, I must admit. So what's your most famous food here? Jelly deals. They're just the best thing we sell. Famous for it, so you've got to try them. Thank you. Good for you. Good. I'm sure. It's, uh, it's a meaty texture, but it's a very strong fishy taste, so it's a bit sort of a cross between meat and fish. But it's quite juicy, which is really quite nice. When cooked, the eels, which are a type of fish, sweat out their juices, which set into a thick jelly. When eels were still the staple of the working man, stalls such as this covered the East End. Today, only Tubby Isaacs remains. There's a lot of people moved out around here. I suppose they can't make money, so they've had to give up. There's only one left. Uh, it's just uh, economics, I suppose. It's just the way it is. <laughs> where we might go soon ourselves. <laughs> Tubby Isaacs represents a unique link to the area's past. A Jewish East Ender who sold traditional street food. 
a link to both a people and a way of life that have all but disappeared from Brook Lane and its surroundings. Little evidence remains today of the thriving Jewish community which made the East End their home. But if you look carefully and closely enough at certain buildings like this school, you'll see signs of Brick Lane's Jewish past. But for the most part, the faded shop fronts are all that remains of a street that was once at the centre of the Jewish East End, the adoptive home of many of the 100,000 Eastern European Jews who fled to Britain following their persecution in Russia in the 1880s. Alan Dean is a journalist and historian who has spent much of his life documenting Brick Lane's Jewish past in an attempt to ensure that the area's rich history is not forgotten. His own grandparents fled persecution in Russia and settled in the East End. His uncle Lou worked in Bloom's, the last kosher restaurant in the area, which closed its doors in 1992. Bloom's restaurant had been founded in the 1930s. It was a busy, bustling Jewish restaurant. Not only is it, was it popular with Jewish people, but it was popular with EastEnders in general. It was, it was the, it was the flavour of East London in, a, in that part of the 1930s and 1940s. Just like today, people come up and down Brick Lane to sample the curries, the curry houses of East London. People came to Blooms from all over to sample what they called Jewish food, Hamisher food, home from the Haim, home from the home, the old Jewish home. But what we have to also think about when we look back at the Jewish community or the history of the Jewish community in East London, most of the food was sold on the street. A very famous lady called Bagel Annie, and she would sit on the floor with the bagels all around her, and people would come up to her and buy the bagels from, from literally in the street. Street food, the street hustle was what it was all about. Despite the popularity of Blooms and the vibrant Jewish community, there were many who resented the intrusion into the East End of these new migrants, competing for jobs and housing. Suspicion, mistrust and rumours were quick to spread. When the infamous Jack the Ripper murders took place in the streets around Brick Lane in 1888, Word spread that these killings were the work of newly arrived Jews, perhaps even one of the new kosher butchers that had set up shop in the area. The murders were never solved, but the rumours highlighted a dark undercurrent of social tension and xenophobia in the area. From the time that the big wave of new settlers arrived in the east end of London in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was what is known as anti-alienism. People were not happy with new arrivals. People were saying they were taking their jobs and so forth. But also for the Jewish community who lived to, at the south end of Brick Lane, wandering north past the railway bridge, this, this old railway bridge, further down towards Bethnal Green, you were actually going into what was known as fascist territory and it would be difficult. So people became very clannish, they stayed within their patch. If you wandered off your patch into the wrong area, you could be beaten up for being Jewish. Today, a man sells samosas on the spot where the black shirts of the British Union of Fascists once stood. The Jewish community has gone, not because it was driven out, but instead because of a natural process of integration. What you found then, you find now, the older generation, the first arrivals, tended to stick to their world. That was the world they knew. If you were a youngster born in London, whether you were Jewish or Bangladeshi or Somalian, wherever you're from, you adapt. You have a bit of your old world with your new world. And that was certainly the case with the Jewish community. The youngsters wanted to be cockneys. They wanted to be East Enders. They wanted to box. They wanted to play football. They wanted to go to clubs. They wanted to listen to jazz music. They didn't all want to be, go to the synagogue. They didn't all didn't want to just eat Jewish food. Did we ever get a period whereby some of the Jewish cuisine started taking a bit from the English cuisine at all? Fish and chips, one of the most famous British foods, was first sold by a Jewish restaurateur on the Whitechapel Road. And what's very interesting is the assimilation of Jewish food into English cuisine. 25 years ago, if you said a bagel, they would not know whether it was bread, fish or meat. They had no idea what it was. But it, that's part of the cultural assimilation. On Brook Lane, the bagel remains a symbol of this assimilation. Bread cooked in an alien fashion, shaped like a ring, boiled in water and baked in a special oven. I came to the East End of London in 1958, uh, after my army, uh, two and a half years in the army, in the Israeli army. And uh, we're looking for something better in life to do, you know. And then we came to Brick Lane. 
and we saw people baking bread and bagel, the old people, and we learned from them how to make. And that's why we established ourselves in Brickland because it's a very, very famous Jewish uh, area. Sami is a reminder that the area was once home to a thriving Jewish community. And he insists that the bagel can still hold its own against the challenge from the curry houses in the Brick Lane of today. The bagel was here before uh, the Indian came from India to, and brought the tradition with them. So in other words, people knew about the bagel before the curry and all this. With the bagel, it's something light. People don't like to get involved with heavy meal, especially during the night. That's why we're very busy during the night. And they come here and eat bagel with filled fill in bagel. Sammy is 70 and shows no sign of slowing down. He visits his bakery every evening to ensure his bagels are fresh and his customers are happy. The bagels are no longer officially kosher and the clientele is no longer Jewish. But Sammy's salt beef bagels, like Tubby's jellied eels, continue to outlive the communities that created them. The way of life has changed completely in the East End. You get people more relaxed more happy. Uh, you pop in during the night, you see the queue along the shop, and you see a big tail, and people keep asking me, why, why are you busy all the time? I say people like to follow the tail. When they see a big tail, they like to follow it, and that's a fact. The Bangladeshi community is not the first group to have made Brick Lane its home. But it's hard to walk down the street today without feeling like you've stepped into a little piece of South Asia. Music stores sell the latest Bangla hits. Supermarkets sell the bony fish from the rivers of Bengal. Bengali signs leave you in no doubt as to where you are, or what you've come to eat. Bengali food is unique because uh, the uh, way the food is prepared. Bengali food is, we eat a lot of rice. With rice we need uh, curry which is runny, watery I mean so that uh, when you eat the rice, it soaks your throat. Like you say in Western terms, that when you are eating, you need a good wine to wash it down. So therefore, with the rice, you need a curry, which will wash it down your throat. Along with their food, the Mongolis brought their religion. And each Friday, the Jama Mosque on Brick Lane fills as the community comes together in prayer. But the sense of permanence is perhaps illusory. A century earlier, the mosque was the center of the equally thriving Jewish community. There was not enough Jewish people around here in this area to, to continue with the synagogue, so they decided to sell it. All that remains to mark their presence is a plaque on the wall dedicating the synagogue's classrooms. Today, these rooms are being renovated to teach a different religion together with traditional Bangladeshi values a distinct culture that the mosque's vice president fears is slowly disappearing. It's much better nowadays. There are very few racial attack or racial tension in this area, but we are facing different things. That our younger generation, some of them are involved in, in antisocial activities uh, and involved in, you know, or addicted to the drugs and things like that. Integration has brought its own difficulties, but the Bangladeshi migrants of the 1970s faced far greater dangers. In one notorious incident, a young man, Al-Tab Ali, was stabbed to death on his way back from work. Today, the park at the southern end of Brick Lane carries his name. This was a derelict street. I remember it very vividly. It was corrugated tin sheets uh, across the road everywhere. Uh, you know, and uh, all, most of the buildings were, when I saw it, it was demolished. It was uh, really a disused part of East End. Mukim Ahmed was one of these early arrivals. The rural lives many of these migrants had lived left them ill-prepared for the conditions they faced in Britain. We Bengalis, we are very relaxed because we have got no problems. As, uh, you see, we don't have to 
uh, fight for our uh, existence, fight for our food. Soil is very fertile. Therefore, you throw rice, it just grows. And fish is plentiful because fishermen pick fish up from all around, you know, and therefore life is very easy. What I'm trying to say that we are a nation of thinkers and, uh, you know, philosophers, really, uh, and not a nation of warriors. I think we Bengalis were very frightened to cross the bridge at the end of Brick Lane because we thought the trouble awaits us there and anybody going along that way would be troubled by these skinheads. So if you were to go on the other side of the street uh, across uh, the bridge or under the bridge, we would uh, call a taxi and, and try and avoid the trouble because we were here and we didn't, didn't want to get into any sort of trouble. Uh, we wanted just to work, make our living you know, earn a living and go back home. Alan Dean remembers the mood in the dark days of the 70s, when the hostility that had once been directed towards the Jewish community was turned on the Bangladeshi migrants. Brick Lane came to be regarded as the front line for supporters of the right-wing British National Front Party. The bridge became a symbol, a symbol of the two worlds, particularly in the 1970s and the 1980s, with the rise of the National Front. And the National Front in that time targeted the Bengali community, particularly in Brick Lane. I was a student here at the time and I remember skinheads, National Front skinheads, going up and down Brick Lane, hitting anybody who looked Asian, smashing shop windows, confronting provocative attacks on the Bengali community. The bridge which divided two worlds is now gone and Brick Lane has become a very different place. Bangladeshi workers, who started in the clothes industry, moved into the restaurant trade in the 1980s, when competition from South Asia, including their native Bangladesh, drove the factories out of business. It turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as curry, and particularly the Bengali version of it, quickly became Britain's favourite food. Britain became very popular and it became the curry capital of London, really. Uh, but then with this success, uh, what has happened, new people have come into the street and because they are not getting enough business, uh, they thought of pulling people in by touting and then we try to stop those people touting and then another group of people would open up restaurants and they haven't got any business, so they start touting. So the other people uh, who were not touting start touting as well because they are losing business. So it became a cash 23 situation. Today, Brick Lane has become a victim of its own success. Where there was once one restaurant, now there are 50. And the owners have little choice but to compete for the available business. And I think we have come to a situation point when there are restaurants we are closing. And if we guys don't uh, see it and pinpoint the problems we are facing and try and solve it, then most of us will vanish in about two years' time. Some restaurants have already changed their approach. At the Grand Bangla, owner Abdul Shahid has decided to go back to the basics of Bengali cuisine. The idea behind this restaurant was, um, as there is a very, uh, vast number of restaurants who are catering for uh, European palate with uh, dishes from different regions, I want to specialize and look at one region, my own Bangladesh. The food we prepare are authentic to the sense that this is what we eat at home. The, my customers are mainly Bangladeshi because it's traditional food. Because every culture has an identity. Their identity could be in the culture-wise, and food is part of the culture. But like others on Brick Lane, Abdul Shahid is pessimistic about the future. About the lane, it's very hard for me to say. Uh, reason being the rent and rates. Plus, the other thing is the city is moving upward. So uh, property prices are becoming very extortionate. I don't see the future being wonderful and bright. I think it's going to be very hard. Uh, some of us, if we work harder than what we are used to or capable of doing, you know, we, we have to put in more blood than sweat, then maybe some of us will still be here. Brick Lane is becoming even more popular, and not just for curries. On Sunday, a street food market offers a diverse menu to an international crowd. Tourists enjoy the novelty of halal fajitas and chocolate crepes on the site where Jack the Ripper murdered his second victim. The fascists and skinheads may have gone, 
that progress and prosperity offer a far more serious threat to the future of the Bangladeshi community. Brick Lane today faces a new wave of immigrants, but this time they're not coming from across the ocean, but from across town. City slickers are moving in. For centuries, the East End was the poor slum area on the edge of London's expensive city centre. But this is changing fast. The fine houses of the French Huguenots are once again becoming homes for the wealthy, and the old Jewish fur shops of Brick Lane have been transformed into coffee shops and milliners. Brick Lane runs from Bethnal Green Road. Tariq Shurdum is an estate agent who saw the potential of Brick Lane more than a decade ago. He saw a familiar pattern developing. The street was very run down, and the initial move here was really the, the artist scene, followed by uh, the fashion crowd, I would say, it's very popular with the, with the fashion crowd, the media crowd, and lastly, the city crowd. The temptation always is to look in and say the price increases, uh, the higher business rates, everything really is, is driving you know, the local Bengalis out and they can't afford to live here, etc., etc., which is uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of left-wing, middle-class English way of looking at things. But I think that uh, the other side of that coin is, is, is these things don't happen, the area stagnates and uh, the Bengalis remain trapped in what they see as a ghetto. The Bangladeshi community are determined to leave more of a mark than their predecessors. Shoreditch Underground Station closed its doors two years ago in anticipation of the new tube line being built for the 2012 Olympics. A Bangladeshi group is lobbying for the station to be renamed Bangladesh when it's reopened. I think the Huguenots, the Jews, they, they were not very keen on this area. We Bengalis are more keen on this area. We want to leave our footprint stronger than they have and we want to uh, therefore, call it Bangla Town and, and, and really leave our mark here. And uh, because those people became more affluent and they moved away from the area, but we have become affluent, we are not moving away from the area. Uh, we take a little bit good from each culture and we d evolve and develop something better. And uh, for our next generation, they are mixing with all societies. And from different societies, people are learning different cultures, and that is the next generation. I think they work it out better than some of us in the past. Communities have come and gone on Brick Lane, and it remains to be seen whether the Bengalis will last longer than their predecessors. Whatever the future of the community, one thing is certain. Bengali cuisine is here to stay, and curry, like jellied eels and salt beef bagels before it, will remain a part of the rich tradition of food on the East End's most famous street.